So I am here with Bhante Vimala Ramsey, and he is across from me, ready to go on. And today is uh, August 9th, 2020, and he will be doing Sutta uh, number four from the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, Fear and Dread. Okay. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anath and Pendika's Park. Now you can hear everything good? Yeah. Okay. Then the Brahmin Janasasoni went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said, Master, go to Ma. When clansmen have gone forth from the home life into a homelessness out of faith in the Master Gotama, do they have Master Gotama for their leader, for their helper, for their guide? And do these people follow the example of Master Gotama? That is so, Brahman, that is so. When clansmen have gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of faith in me, they have me for their leader, for their helper and guide. And these people follow my example. But Master Gotama, Remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice, and it is hard to enjoy solitude. One would think that the jungles must rob a monk of his mind if he has no concentration. That is so, Brahman, that is so, remote remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice, and it is hard to enjoy solitude. One would think that the jungles must rob a monk of his mind if he has no concentration. Now they're talking about one-pointed concentration not what we are practicing here. Although, as, as we go along, you'll, you'll see more and more why it is so important to keep the six R's readily available for, for you while you're doing your practice and while you're living. Before my awakening, well, I was still only an unawakened bodhisattva. I too considered thus, remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. The jungles must rob a monk of his mind if he has no concentration. Now what we're talking about here is getting involved in your thinking about and not using the six R's or the Four Noble Truths. And that's a problem. I considered thus, Whenever recluses or Brahmins, unpurified in their bodily conduct, resort to a remote jungle thicket resting place in the forest, then owing to the defect of their unpurified bodily conduct, these good recluses and Brahmins invoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, unpurified in bodily conduct. I am purified in bodily conduct. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest 
as one of the noble ones with bodily conduct terrified. Seeing in myself this purity of bodily conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. Now, it's real easy to let your imagination get carried away when you're by yourself in the forest. And it's, uh, it, it can cause a lot of fear and anxiety. Now, this is because you're not following the precepts as closely as you can. This whole sutta is about the precepts. And it's very amazing to me how many people think that meditation is just about sitting and not about living a good, uplifted mind and being careful with your uh, bodily actions as well as your mental actions. I considered thus, whenever recluses or brahmins unpurified in their verbal conduct or unpurified in their mental conduct, unpurified in livelihood, resort to a jungle thicket resting place in the forest, they all evoke unwholesome fear and dread. Now, many times when I've given a, a discourse on the suttas, I try to get you to understand this is an all-the-time practice. If you break your precepts, it causes your mind to feel guilty. When mind feels guilty, then you are developing the wrong idea in a personal self. You're not seeing things with a purified mind. You're seeing things with a guilty mind. And that causes you to identify with all of your thoughts and all of your feelings. And this is a, a big hindrance for your progress in meditation. Now, one of the things that's real important for you to understand is the, the six R's are right effort. The six R's are the way leading to the cessation of suffering, the fourth noble truth. And the more closely you follow that, the more you have a quiet mind, a mind that doesn't get so involved in uh, the distractions and fear and anxiety and high emotions and things like that. It causes a lot of problems. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with livelihood, uh, pure speech, and pure thoughts along with pure bodily action. Seeing in myself this purity I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I don't know if you've lived in the forest. I, I do live in the forest here, but there's all kinds of different sounds that can come up. And it can cause fear and anxiety to arise. Oh, what was that sound? And 
you can really get caught up, so much caught up that you want to run away. You want to get out of the forest. Uh, I'm, I'm reading what it says here, and it says something about Sutta 17, and this is Sutta number four. Anyway, the more you keep your precepts without breaking them, the easier your mind settles down. Now, we've all broken precepts. That's one of the reasons why we're here, is because we have broken precepts in the past. And that causes craving to arise. What's the cause of craving? Breaking one of the precepts and taking things personally. Taking things with a mind that says, this is me, this is mine, this is who I am. I like this, I don't like that. And you don't have such a good mind for tranquility and equanimity. The stronger your equanimity becomes through using the six R's and going through the jhanas, the jhanas are levels of understanding. It's a misunderstood word by an awful lot of people. And the Buddha spent his time teaching this. He didn't teach straight vipassana only. He taught jhana with vipassana. They are uh, yoked together. It says in Sutta number 149 in the Majjhima Nikaya. So the idea of breaking up Vipassana and Jhana practice comes from commentaries and it's not, uh, it's not helpful in your practice you tend to have one-pointed concentration when you're doing vipassana, even though they say it's not that kind of concentration. It is. Why do I say that? Because it doesn't have the relaxed step that is very much needed. Why? Because when there's a slight tension or tightness in your mind, you have the I like it, I don't like it mind. And this is the very beginning of taking things personally. This happens because you are... Uh, feeling guilty about something you said or something you did in the past. That's why hindrances arise. And hindrances, unlike an awful lot of people that are practicing meditation, they think that hindrances are to be suppressed, pushed down, not get involved with, Make go away. Oh, I have a friend that's been teaching meditation, straight vipassana for 50 years. And he still has trouble with hindrances. That means that there's some kind of misunderstanding in that kind of practice. If you don't recognize that 
Craving is the I like it, I don't like it mind. When a feeling arises, and relax and let go of that feeling, then you are not practicing what the Buddha is talking about. The Buddha talked a lot about the Four Noble Truths in the discourses, but an awful lot of people don't recognize it as the Four Noble Truths because it, it talks in a different way. Every link of dependent origination has the Four Noble Truths in it. Every link. which is another way of saying you need to use the six R's whenever there's any kind of disturbance in your mind at all. Any kind. The second R of uh, the six R's is to release whatever is pulling your attention away from your object of meditation. It doesn't matter what your distraction is, if it's a physical feeling or a mental feeling. Fear and dread are always mental and then it turns into physical. But first it is a mental feeling. Now, I spend a lot of time in Asia with people that are very much into their fears and anxieties of hungry ghosts and curses and all of these kind of things that cause fear to arise. And what I've learned is that when you use the six R's and you get to the smile, re-smile, if you laugh with yourself for being afraid, the fear disappears very quickly. So, I've been criticized because I say we have six R's and I call that right effort. But it is right effort. It's just that some things are uh, intertwined. Let's put it that way. Now, when you have a sensation arise in your body, or you have a disturbance of mind, if you keep your attention on that and you indulge in it and you get involved in thinking about it, you are feeding that hindrance. And it's going to get bigger and it's going to stay longer. What release means is that you allow it to be there by itself. You don't keep your attention on the disturbance. This is really important. Don't keep your attention on the disturbance. Let the disturbance be there by itself. If you start to get caught in thinking about it, all of a sudden your mind is a thousand miles away and you're thinking about this and that. And you don't even know that you're meditating anymore. Actually, you're not meditating anymore because you're getting caught up in this. So it's a real interesting thing that an awful lot of people get caught up in 
Now, there's some meditation teachers and they'll tell you, well, now you need to note this until it goes away by itself. And then you immediately come back to your object of meditation. If you note it until it goes away by itself, you're feeding it and it's going to continue on and your progress in meditation is very, very slow when that happens. Now, a lot of people that I've taught over the years, I've tried to get them to really understand that you don't, it doesn't matter what thought comes up. Now, when I first became a monk, I did a practice where every time a thought or feeling or sensation arose, I looked at that very closely and I thought, is that mine? Did I ask that thought to come up? Why do these thoughts come up? Whose thoughts are they? Where do they go when they disappear? Now, I did this for about six months with as many times as I could remember to investigate that way. And it, it got to be very interesting and my mind slowed down a lot because I stopped taking the thoughts that just kind of popped up in my head. It can be a memory, it can be anything. When it popped up into my head, did I ask, I asked myself the question, did I ask this thought to come up? Is this me? Is this mine? Where did it come from? And I discovered a lot of these thoughts and feelings that came up were from memory of breaking precepts in the past. As I started seeing the impersonal nature of letting go of craving, and started seeing more and more clearly what craving is, I began to understand a lot more about what the Buddha was talking about. So this practice of using the six R's teaches you some magnificent lessons the first is anything that pops up into your mind isn't you. You didn't ask it to come up. Or a feeling. You don't ask feelings to come up. They pop up because conditions are right for them to arise. So what you need to do is stop getting involved with the feelings. Stop trying to control the feelings. Stop trying to control the thoughts. Stop taking emotional upsets as this is me, this is mine. I don't like it. I want it to stop. And the more you get involved in trying to control your emotional upsets, the bigger and more intense that emotion becomes. And the more confused your mind becomes. And the more anger comes up. And the more hatred comes up. And the dissatisfaction and the fear and the anxiety. All of these things arise because you're taking it personally. Because you broke a precept in the past. And when you break a precept, you have a guilty mind. And with that guilty mind comes the I am that. That's the very beginning of craving. That's what craving is. So recognizing uh, the tightness that happens in your head, in your mind, 
is a very important aspect. And the only time you get to recognize it is when you stop getting involved with your thoughts and your emotions and your likes and your dislikes and your opinions and your ideas. Let go of that. Relax. Smile. Come back to your object of meditation. Now with your daily activities, your object of meditation can be smiling. Lightening your mind. The more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. Now one of the things that happens with a lot of people when they start going deeper in their meditation and start getting into neither perception or non-perception. My advice to them quite often is you need to sharpen your mindfulness more. You need to have a lighter mind, an observant mind, a mind that's clear, that recognizes the slightest little movements. This is important if you want to attain Nibbana. Quite often people will get into, a, they break into a habit. They're used to doing the meditation this way or that way and they see some kind of little disturbance and they just, they don't, relax and let it go, they just say, well, it'll be there for a little while. Who pays attention to that? That's nothing. Well, they need to sharpen their mindfulness. Now, the thing is, when you start going deeper in your meditation, you start noticing more and more how the consciousnesses arise. We don't care what that consciousness is, whether it's seeing or hearing or tasting or touching or whatever, or thinking. We don't care what the content is. We want to see how this process actually works. You don't get a chance to see how this process works when you are noting until it goes away. That means you're still involved with it and you're taking it personally. You're not relaxing that tension and tightness in your head, in your mind. Now I say in your head and in your mind because this is part of the Nama Rupa. This is part of the mind-body connection. When you let go of tension in your mind, you actually let go of tension in your body at the same time. So it's real important for you to recognize and sharpen your mindfulness so you can see when mind first starts to get distracted. And when it gets distracted, that's when you want to use the six R's. I've had a lot of people tell me well, I don't need to use the six R's anymore. Well, yeah, you do. But when you get to certain places in the meditation, when you get very deep, that's when I'll tell somebody, well, just relax. Just let go of that slight tension caused by that disturbance. Every disturbance that arises, everything that pulls your attention away, is a hindrance. And it means that your mindfulness is not as sharp as it could be. And it needs to get sharper. Now I get criticized a lot because I tell people that they have to smile. But what people don't really recognize is that the more you smile, the lighter your mind becomes, the lighter your mind becomes, 
the sharper your awareness of what is happening in the present occurs. And this is really important. So, I have a lot of people that when they first start out in meditation, they tell me they can't smile. Well, that's because they don't want to smile. They think they're supposed to be serious with the meditation. But when I give instructions at the start of a retreat, I tell everyone there's three things that I really want you to understand. You have to smile. You have to laugh occasionally with yourself because you get caught. What does laughing do? I've, I've been in situations where there's anger that comes up. Everybody has. If you look at it closely, at what anger is, it's dissatisfaction with whatever is happening in the present. And Okay, that happens to all of us. But you're taking it personally and you're building up that feeling and you're causing yourself a lot of pain. An interesting thing with Buddhism is that it will help you to change if you want to change. Everything about Buddhism is about looking at yourself very closely and what are you taking personally and how are you causing yourself pain? You can't blame anybody else for your pain. Your pain is yours and you're causing it to yourself. That's what you have to learn. That's how you change. As you become more and more aware of smiling and laughing and actually having fun with your meditation, when you do this, your progress is really fast. Now, I'm in the habit now of just giving a 10-day retreat to people and having them be very successful with their meditation. Why? Because of those first three things that I talk about at the start of the retreat. Smile, laugh, have fun. Too many people are serious with their meditation. And that's a problem. Because you try too hard when you get serious. And you try to force your mind to be the way you want it to be. It doesn't work. I promise, it doesn't work. My biggest problem was teaching people, especially if they've done other kinds of meditation, my biggest problem is to get them to stop trying so hard and stop being so serious. Mind is heavy when it's serious. And anytime you have Repeat thoughts in your mind, guess who has an attachment and guess who's got by their hindrances. And they're taking it personally and they're causing themselves immeasurable amounts of pain. So the thing that's most remarkable about Buddhist practice is the responsibility you have to take for yourself. You can't blame anybody else for your pain, for your suffering, for your dissatisfaction. It's not anybody else's fault. It's yours, and you're doing it to yourself. 
Now, every time you use the six R's, you are learning and you're teaching yourself a magnificent lesson. And that is right after you use the six R's, your mind is clear, your mind is bright. It has no distractions in it. And your mind is pure because there is no craving. So using the six R's is incredibly important. And the more you smile, the better your mindfulness becomes. And mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. How, it, how do you observe this happening? What happens first? Well, your mindfulness gets weak for whatever reason. Then you start to have little tiny thoughts and they grow and they get bigger until it turns into a full-blown distraction. As you go deeper in your meditation and you start learning more and more clearly about how this process works and how it's not my process, it is just happening because conditions are right for it to occur. And as you learn this and use the six R's, there is personality development. And you become more and more balanced with your thinking. The things that used to, the people used to say to you and got you angry, it's not so important anymore. Your mind becomes more clear, brighter, clearer, alert, and fun. Oh, but you're supposed to be serious with meditation. I've done a lot of meditation, a lot, with a lot of different people. And for the first 20 years of my practice, whenever I walked into where people were doing the meditation, nobody was smiling. And I always had a headache. I'd walk in and all of a sudden this tension and tightness is really caught up here. And it stayed there for the whole retreat. What is that tension and tightness? Well, that's craving. Now, I spent 12 years in Asia going to different teachers, asking them about craving because it's talked about so much in the suttas, but almost no one knows what it actually is or how to recognize it or how to let it go in a real way. That's what the Eightfold Path is all about. Every time you use the six R's, you are following the Eightfold Path at that time. And you develop more and more equanimity until it gets to disenchantment, where your mind just doesn't get excited about stuff at all. You see things the way they are, and that's fine. But you don't get distracted by it. That's what equanimity is all about. It's letting go of the emotional excitement of daily life. Now, some people would call that, well, that, that must be boring to have a life like that. No, actually, it's just the opposite. Because your mind is lighter, you see things more clearly, and you can help yourself and other people overcome the 
emotional quagmire that we get into. So when the Buddha is talking about going into the forest, if you go into the forest with a mind that is clear, bright, and you have followed the precepts very well, you're not going to have a lot of fear and anxiety arise. I consider thus, whenever a recluse or a Brahmin who are covetous and full of lust, they have problems. They have fear and anxiety coming up and they get afraid. Now, when I first went to Thailand, the start of my being, uh, being a monk, I started listening to them talk about their yeah. I listened to them talk about their uh, ghost stories, things like that. And I went into the forest. Now, I was about a quarter of a mile or half a mile away from anybody else. I was quite secluded. And I got up about two o'clock in the morning and decided that I was going to do some walking meditation outside. Now, when you do your walking meditation outside, you take two candles. And you put one at the one side of the walk and the other at the other end of the walk. And that way you can walk in a straight line without any problem. And as I was walking, I noticed some extra lights out of the corner of my eye. And I had fear arise. I didn't quite know what to do with that. So I kept walking, and all of a sudden my imagination started taking off. And I started thinking about, well, there might be some of the spirits around that really aren't very nice, and they're going to eat me alive. And then I saw the lights again out of the corner of my eye. Now... Because of this sutta that I'm reading to you right now, it, later on it recommends that when you are when you have fear arise, don't change your posture. If you're standing, continue standing. If you're walking, continue walking. If you're sitting, continue sitting. If you're lying down, continue lying down until that fear disappears. Now, it so happened that I was standing at that time, and I saw this white light out of the corner of my eye. And I decided, well, you know, maybe it's time for me to go back in the cabin and get under the covers and go back to sleep. And then I remembered what the sutta said, and I continued standing, and I turned my head, and I looked, just as some lights came on again, and I found out that it was fireflies. It's little tiny bugs that light up at night. And I was so afraid until I found out what it was. And then I just laughed. Now, I, I started talking about the advantage of laughing. When you laugh with yourself, you go from, I am that. I am that anger, that fear, that anxiety, whatever it happens to be, depression. And then you laugh, it changes your perspective. And you go from, I am that, to it's only that. It's only this 
dislike. It's only this fear. It's only this anxiety. It's only this depression. Whose depression is it? Well, it's mine. It's not yours when you laugh. Then you find out what it actually is. And when you see what it actually is, the fear and anxiety subside on their own. Now, this is a big problem in Asia because people are very afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they break precepts. They don't see what they're doing. They don't think that a little white lie is any big deal. And it is. Anytime you try to deceive the world with your speech, that is breaking a precept. So even little tiny lies are still lies and it is a problem. And you're causing the problem to yourself. So please take it seriously. This is real. And you will see that when you keep the precepts, you are letting go of troubles in your life. Keeping the precepts is a kind of protection for you. And it also makes life much easier. What kind of reputation do you have? Now, I've, I've taught a lot of businessmen and they tell me, well, I have to lie. And I say, why? Why do you have to lie? Well, I need to make the sales. And I said, what kind of reputation do you have? When, you, when they know that what you're saying isn't true. Oh, I never thought of it that way. So this is a real interesting example of how to let go of the precepts and let go of breaking the hindrances and truly understanding how you are causing yourself upset and problems because you break the precepts. And then you try to forget about it, but it always comes back. I have friends that were very much into their cursing. And then they would come and do a, re a, pre a retreat with me. And the first seven days of a 10 day retreat, they had a lot of problems with hindrances, always coming up. Oh, I have to keep six Ring, I have to keep letting go. This is a problem. But when they finally got the idea that the precepts are real and not breaking them is important, even telling a joke that is off color, Then they started progressing in their meditation very fast. But sometimes it takes a while for people to understand that this kind of thing, although, quote, it can be funny, it's offensive. People that curse a lot, and that's what's happening a lot. I mean, you see it on TV, you listen to it on the radio. I was very shocked when I came back from Asia at how how much cursing and foul language they were using in public. And then people wonder why there's so many problems in the world today. How many people are breaking their precepts all the time? Oh, but that's morality and, and uh, we don't have to pay attention to that. 
we only have to practice our morality when we're practicing sitting meditation, doing a retreat. Well, I'm here to tell you that you need it more off all the time. You have to stop letting go of breaking the precepts. And you will find after a period of time that everything starts to become easier. And your prosperity starts to come up by itself. It's amazing to watch. And you start thinking about something possibly you need to do or need to, well, I need to get this so that my computer works and my phone works better. All of a sudden it pops up by itself. Somebody comes along and says, here, use this. And that makes life more fun. So, if you're overcome by sloth and torpor, if you're overcome by restlessness and unpeacefulness in mind, if you're overcome by being uncertain and, and doubting, if you're given to self-praise and disparagement of others, if there is alarm and terror, are you free from this kind of trepidation? Or are you overly concerned with the pandemic? Oh, I'm so afraid I have to wear a mask all the time. I don't. Okay. If you're desirous of gain and honor and renown, there are some things that when monks start learning about their practice, one of the first things that happens, it's, it's like the first test, is that you start to get famous. And you, you start to really think that you're something special. That's a, that's a hindrance in itself being humble, being appreciative of other people. That's the kind of mind you want to be developing. If you're lazy and you're wanting an energy, oh, I don't feel like sitting today. You need to develop that mind that gets enthusiastic. Now I'm going to get a chance to sit and get quiet for a little while. I have a student that he did uh, three or four retreats with me. And he kept on asking me at the end of the retreats, how long should I sit? So I said, well, sit seven or eight hours a day. That'll be enough. And he started doing that. And his meditation is so good. And he's so much fun to be around because he keeps his precepts. He does a lot of meditation. He has, he's incredibly knowledgeable and bright. Although he doesn't do a lot of reading. He follows his intuition a lot. And he has fun sitting with a quiet mind. How much relief is that? <coughs> Could you get me a glass of water? Sorry. Okay, if you have an unconcentrated mind, then your mind is straying a lot. 
That happens with a lot of people that come for the first time they do the retreat. Oh, my mind is so active. Yeah, well, why? Because you've let your mind get sloppy. You let your mind break precepts, thinking that it's cute or it's funny or uh, this, is, this is real important. It's not. It's more important to keep your presets than it is to try to make a joke and make somebody laugh. Whenever recluses and Brahmins devoid of wisdom, their drivelers resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their being devoid of wisdom and drivelers, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. And I do not do that. Thank you. Excuse me. Seeing in myself this possession of wisdom, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. I personally like being in the forest and I like being alone. I considered thus, there are the especially auspicious nights of the 14th, the 15th and 8th of the fortnight. Now what if on such a night as these I were to dwell in such awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes as orchard shrines, woodland shrines, and tree shrines, of which there's a lot in Asia. Perhaps I might encounter that fear and dread and later on such especially auspicious nights as the 14th, the 15th, and the 8th of the fortnight. I dwell in such awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes as forest shrines, woodland shrines, and tree shrines. And while I dwelt there, a wild animal, animal would come up to me, or a peacock would knock off a branch, or the wind would rustle the leaves. And I thought, what if this is the fear and dread coming? I thought, why do I dwell always expecting fear and dread? What if I subdue that fear and dread while keeping the same posture that I'm in when it comes up upon me? So this is where it's talking about don't change your posture once you have the fear and dread coming. While I walked, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither stood nor sat nor lied down till it had subdued that I had subdued that fear and dread. While I stood, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor sat nor lied down till it had sub I had subdued that fear and dread. Now remember, fear and dread is easy to let go of if you don't take it personally. It's a, it's a, a feeling that is not nice. It's a painful feeling. But as soon as it comes up, we have a tendency to run away from it. Try to get away so you don't have that fear and dread. That's how strong it is. Actually, the way to let it go is by laughing with yourself for being afraid. And then you'll see what that fear and dread is. And quite often, it's uh, occasionally we have birds that like to fly into the windows and knock themselves silly. But if that happens at night, 
oh, that, that, what was that sound? There's, there's a ghost out there. There's something that's going to eat me alive. And you want to run away. But if you laugh with yourself for being afraid, you're not afraid anymore. That's the way you overcome it. There are Brahmin, some recluses and Brahmins, who perceive day when it's night and night when it's day. I say that that part, that their part, this is abiding in delusion. I perceive night when it's night and day when it's day. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, a being not subject to delusion has appeared in the world for the welfare and happiness of many, out of compassion for the world, for the good welfare and happiness of gods and humans. It is of me indeed that, rightly speaking, this should be said. Tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established. Now, the word mindfulness is really misunderstood. And I've, I've had a lot of the teachers that I ask about the word mindfulness tell me it means to be mindful. Well, okay, but you can't use the word you're defining as the definition. So that's why I tell you it's remembering to observe how mind's attention moves. Seeing the slightest movement of mind's attention and recognizing as soon as it starts and you relax and let it go and don't keep your attention on it, that will disappear very quickly. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind was collected and unified. That's the advantage of keeping the precepts. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and pleasure born of her happiness, born of seclusion. Now, again, jhana does not mean one-pointedness. It does not mean keeping your mind only on your object of meditation. At first, you have to Bring up a feeling of loving kindness. Feel that feeling. Put that feeling in your heart. Put your friend right in the middle of the feeling. So there's more activity than just focusing on one part of the meditation. And that's what true mindfulness is. Observing how this process works. With the stilling of thinking and examining thought, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, which has neither self, has, which has self-confidence and stillness of mind, without thinking and examining thought, with joy and happiness born of collectedness. Every jhana is a different step of your learning. You're teaching yourself. When you go from the first jhana to the second jhana, you start noticing the difference. You're able to stay with your object of meditation longer. You start having more joy arise. You start feeling more at ease, and you feel like you are progressing. That's why you get self-confidence. Yeah, that's the way it, say it. it says in the sutta. That's the way it says it's supposed to be. 
This is not some commentarial idea of what insight knowledges are and things like that. This is about the actual practice and how you're teaching yourself to recognize when your mind is distracted, to use the six R's, not to keep your attention on the distraction. Let it be there by itself. Don't keep your attention on it. Relax the tightness caused by that distraction. Then smile. Bring that smiling back to your object of meditation. Stay with your object of meditation. Every level of understanding, every jhana is a different kind of meditation because the results are different at each level. So people say, well, that's four jhanas. Yeah, uh, yeah. okay. I'm talking long, I, I just got found out. Well, uh, there's a lot more to this sutta, and it has the, the three super knowledges that it talks about. Um, after you get to the fourth jhana, then you start working with remembering past lifetimes. Then you develop your divine eye and divine ear, and you can go to all different realms of meditation. And then you can attain nibbana from that. But this goes through the whole thing. I'm not going to do that now. I've been talking for too long, I understand. So, do you have any questions? You can unmute and ask now. Nobody has any questions? Boy, I must be a great teacher if I don't have any questions. I answered everything and you understood it without any doubt at all. Thank you, Bhante, for your talk. I have a question, if I may ask. Then let's share some merit. Oh, 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 wait, we got a question. Okay, good for us. Yes. Thank you, Bhante, again for your talk. I have a, a quick okay. question. Uh, is it possible to I go know. into jhana? Is it possible to go into jhana from listening? To a Who's doctor. asking and what question do you have? Uh, hi, this is Omero from Los Angeles. Um. Hello? Yes, hi, this is Omero from Los Angeles. Ah, uh, okay, I can hear you now. Please ask. Right. But well, my question is, is it possible for someone to go into the first jhana just from listening to uh, the suttas? Yes. Listening to the Dhamma talk? Yes. You have to do it with a very attentive mind that doesn't think about other stuff while you're listening. Okay. The Buddha called that giving ear. Have, you, you give ear by just a paying attention. You can get into jhanas while you're listening, and you can actually attain becoming a sotapanna while you're listening. But you have to truly understand what you're listening to with a very attentive mind. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. Okay. <laughs> May I ask a question, Auntie? Yes, of course. Uh, I wanted to ask you what's the difference between fear and dread and the fear and shame of wrongdoing. How would you explain? Fear, fear and dread kind of arises on its own because conditions are right. Knowing that you are going to break a preset, that's the fear and and wrongdoing 
that you experience you can experience so you have to be careful with what you're going to say before you say it and what you're going to do before you do it but fear and anxiety can be from an outside source it can be an animal running at you or it, it can be any kind of thing like that do you understand the difference yes i just wanted to tell you that uh fly, uh, fright is a reaction of the central nervous system right uh it to protect our self and uh, and here the buddha is talking about fear and dread which is arising from uh, out of uh, we breaking the precepts and uh, we yeah, have that's, fear that of was wrong what i was talking about yeah right. and fear of wrong doing is something that occurs before breaking the precept right yes now the thing with the more you keep the precepts without breaking them the more you understand what you're going to do before you do it and you make a choice whether you're going to break a precept or not but um if you're in a car and somebody looks like they're going to hit you you're going to have fear arise that's different okay thank you okay hello aunty this is anuha from india yes uh, i wanted to ask you about the experience of a stream enterer okay yeah so once you get that experience uh, like i'm just i want to refer to the sutta uh, sutta number 106 from majjhima nikaya yeah and in that uh, ananda asked buddha that uh, how a disciple uh, cannot be cling to the experiences of the jhanas or like attainments so buddha says that a, a disciple with, with clinging cannot attain nibbana so but the uh, but the experience of a stream entry is it's something like mind tends to cling to it because of the relief and everything else how do not to cling to it and who still who clings who clings to it <laughs> okay see that's the thing when you become a sotapanna you start recognizing more and more clearly the yeah. impersonal nature of things so you're not going to cling to it as much okay. and if you're around a teacher like me i'm not going to let you cling to it <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> yeah yeah okay that's all. thank you thank you so much okay yeah uh, pante um, yes. i have around three questions uh, the first question is um, it's related to meditation like once i finish my meditation you recommend to walk right i i didn't quite understand what you just said say it again please okay after meditation uh you recommend uh, to have some walk walk to meditation oh that's that's just part of the meditation yes uh, uh for example if i am sitting with equanimity or a quiet mind while i was walking you recommend me to walk with a uh, quiet mind or something like that walk with that mind yes i prefer that you do whatever jhana you happen to be experience doesn't have to be just while you're sitting it can be with your daily activities walking here to here to there can you have joy arise in your mind while you're walking You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I got the point. Okay. And uh, and I have the next question. Uh, like I notice, I'm noticing that uh, when I'm sitting in the meditation, I'm when the disturbance occurs, I am recognizing it at the stage of formations. 
Stop overanalyzing. As soon as you see a disturbance, 6R right then. Okay. Don't try to overanalyze and are you an engineer? Yes. I thought so. <laughs> You're taught to <laughs> overthink as an engineer. So you want to back off a little bit from that. Don't try to figure out what it is, what what part of your noticing is. Just as soon as you notice, let it be there by itself. Relax, smile, and come back. Okay. Okay? okay. Actually, I was, um, you are right, I can say, like, whenever some distraction is happening, I was linking it to uh, which, uh, which, which link it is, actually. I was like in the dependent origination. Well, you know, I don't call the hindrances, I don't say that this is lust or this is hatred or this is sloth and torpor. I just say it's a hindrance. It's a disturbance. Let it be a disturbance. You don't have to analyze which kind of disturbance it is. Okay. And that's where you get into problems and you, you pulls your attention away. Okay? Okay, okay, okay one thing. Uh, third question is uh, it's not related to meditation. Some people say that uh, like when, whenever I, when I was doing meditation previously with other technique, uh -huh. people used to say that this place is good for meditation, that place is good for meditation, but I don't think so. Uh, what is your stand on that? Like, Well, wherever it's most comfortable for you. You don't have to go by what somebody else says. It's this is a personal thing. It's up to you where where you're most comfortable. Sometimes I'll walk into a room and I'm not comfortable at all, so I'm not going to sit in that room. Other times I walk into a room and it feels really peaceful and really calm. Then I'll sit in med meditation there. It depends on the situation entirely. Uh, actually, today's talk, uh, I feel like uh, it answered most of my questions. Uh, Good. So I'm, I'm thankful for your session today. I have no more questions now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else with a question? Yes, Ponte. Yes. Thank you. I've been a meditator for over 30 years, and I only heard of you in June. <laughs> <laughs> and I took your online course. Oh, good. And I want to tell you, I had such great change, long-awaited change, and I want to thank you. Very well, much. No, you're very welcome, and I'm happy that you found us. I hope to be seeing you in September. Oh, good. Don't be afraid of the virus. We, we don't have that problem here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to meeting you. I look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Bonte. Okay. Anything else? Oh, Bonte. So, uh, I have a quick question. Okay. What are you? What is your advice on balancing a uh, lay life and meditation? What is my advice for what? Saying it uh, again. Uh, balancing lay life and uh, meditating, because I find that like the more I practice the six hours. But the more I meditate, uh, since it feels so good, I want to keep doing it more and more. Good. Continue. <laughs> yeah. As long as you have time to do it, do as much as you can. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Where are you from? 
Uh, I'm from California. Oh, can you come and visit me sometime? I'll make sure to. Or and and some t uh, I have been going to California, Northern California. Um, what's the name of that? Saint Francis. And yes, San Juan Batista. Saint Francis and San Juan Batista. I've been giving retreats there once a year. Oh, okay. So you can come there if you if you have the time and the energy. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Hey, Bonte. Hello. Uh, I have one question today. Okay. Um, and it's about uh, the, the the characteristic of the the first jhana, which is a, I think thinking, thought, and evaluation. Or something along right. those lines. Um, could you describe a little bit more what that is, and is that is that something that we can actively cultivate, or is it just something yes. to notice that arises? You, I have to, that you actively cultivate it, and that is by verbalizing a wish for your friend's happiness, feeling the happiness and wishing that happiness to your friend. That's what the thinking and examining thought is all about. When you get to the second jhana, I'll tell you, don't verbalize anymore. Mm. That's how that's different than the first jhana. Okay. If you continue verbalizing when you get into the second jhana, you're going to give yourself a headache because you're trying too hard. You need to back off a little bit. Um, so, okay, so verbal verbalizing the wish. Is there any um, is there anything other to to verbalize? Like, for example, sometimes I find it helpful to sort of verbalize like oh my mind is distracted or no you don't need to do that you get you need to get into the habit of using the six r's without saying the six r's okay so the, the okay. verbalizing is just the wish for for your friend's happiness right okay all right okay thank you thank you Monte. Oh, it is my pleasure Anything else? One thing, uh, if there are no questions, I want to say one thing. Okay. Yesterday was your birthday. We want to say happy birthday to you. Thank you. I'm not sure I want any more birthdays. I'm getting too old now. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me that I'm getting older. Anyway. So, why don't we share some merit now? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, please come back next week. We'll be, give you another discourse, okay? Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. You're very welcome. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Happy birthday, Bhante. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs>